Welcome to everyone. I'm glad you could join us for this presentation. It's part one. This is we're going to cover the concept of supply chain physics. Um, on December 9th, we'll have part two, and we're going to talk about the very real decision space of supply chain physics. And part three will be strategies for communication and improvement around this concept of supply chain physics. All right, uh, here's the agenda. We're going to talk about, uh, the, present this concept of supply chain physics. We're going to cover a few laws, uh, the three laws that we've come up with that kind of define supply chain physics. Um, discuss some examples, uh, spend a little bit more time on the concept, talk about how we can change the world, and then uh, have a little conclusion and go to the question and answer. So if we're talking about supply chain physics, it's basically a concept, and it's based on um, some science, some engineering, and business principles, but it's a concept. And Within the concept is a language and, and hopefully a set of principles that we can use to, across our businesses and, and within our functions and across functions to make sure that we communicate accountabilities and foster improvement across the enterprise. Um, something like this should always begin with a, a, a definition from the dictionary. So the definition of physics is the science that deals with matter, energy, motion, and force. That's from dictionary.com. And what are we talking about when we talk about the supply chain? Let's define that a little bit. This is a model that I've used uh, over my career. I developed it sometime in the 90s, I think the first time we drew it. And uh, it has two parts. We have a customer service, or order taking and fulfillment part. And we have a manufacturing part. You'll see that. Uh, and. I should give you a caveat here that my background is uh, largely in consumer packaged goods, so some of the terminology from that industry will seep into the presentation here. And we take orders from the trade. The trade in consumer packaged goods is the Walmarts and Carrefours of, of the world. And we process the orders. The, uh, the you know, we, we place, they place the orders, we process the orders, the orders are released to the warehouse through distribution and finally sent back to the customers so they can stock them on their shelves and customers, consumers can come in and buy them from them. In the manufacturing side, we have a manufacturing planning activity who communicates the needs to purchasing, who communicates to the suppliers and uh, uh, contract manufacturers of finished goods. Um, the needs that we have and they will then supply either raw and packed materials or, or finished goods to manufacturing. Manufacturing will add more value to those and then allocate the in inventory to the, to the warehouses. Um, these two sub-processes of the supply chain are linked by something we call forecasting. Um, if you want to act more, I don't know, highbrow, you can call it demand planning, but uh, demand planning and forecasting to me end up being the same thing and usually have about the same error rates. And then the, they're linked also by the movement of goods, the allocation of inventory to warehouses. Okay. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll see that uh, as we move from right to left, we've got information flowing. Okay. Uh, we place an order, the order's processed, the order's released to the warehouse. That's all information, a forecast, a demand plan. That's nothing but information moving from the planning part, the, the customer service part, to the manufacturing part. And then communicating the manufacturing plan to purchasing and then the release of orders to suppliers and, and finished good contract manufacturers. That's also information. But when we start to move from left to right, you will see that we're going from this is the flow of materials. These are the flow of goods. We have raw and packed materials going to manufacturing, um, manufacturing allocating the inventory, uh, inventory moving to warehouses through distribution to the trade. Over time, and usually with the, with the advent of uh, ERP systems, information has become almost instantaneous across the supply chain. If you um, recall, that was an MIT simulation of the supply chain in which you had a beer manufacturing and distributing operation. What you did was they, they had a certain constant demand. The demand changed at one point, and then um, we saw because of the inefficiency of information flow back then that uh, 
it played havoc on the supply chain. It had what they called the bullwhip effect, and next thing you know, you had so much inventory that you glutted the entire system. That was because there was a delay in, in the information, but now that's not the case anymore. You'll see that with ERP systems, information is available all the time. Okay, so, but we still have the flow of goods and products. So part of the supply chain, the part that goes from left to right, is, is operates in the physical world. Things are bought, um, they're delivered to manufacturing, value is added, they're transformed from raw and packed materials into finished goods, and then uh, allocated to warehouses, picked, packed, shipped to customers. So things are happening, they're moving across. So it's real objects, liquid, solids, and gases are being manipulated and moved in space and time. I'm reading the point, it was in red. That sounds a lot like physics to me. And it's, that means there are limits to what can and cannot be done in this world, in this physical world of product movement. And there are laws to be followed. So let's uh, look at some of these laws of supply chain physics. We have three of them. One we call the law of interdependency. The, other, the second is the law of constraints. And the third, the law of information. Uh, the law of interdependency has two parts. Uh, basically, it says inventory, service, quality, and costs are codependent. If you change one, you could change, you will have some adverse or positive effect in the other. We know that there's a relationship between inventory and service. If you have too little inventory or you have the wrong uh, mix of inventory, that will affect your service. If you have quality problems, that will affect the, your costs. If you have too much inventory, that will affect your costs. So there's trade-offs. There, there's a law of interdependency on inventory, service, quality, and cost. In business improvement, there's also an interdependency. You can make your functional improvements in your own little silos to a certain point. And that's certainly true in the supply chain. You can make it as efficient and work on that efficiency all the time. But there's a point of diminishing returns in which to make the next gains, you've got to work across functions. So at a certain point, functions are codependent to take organizational improvement to the next level. The law of constraints. Well, this is the law that says at any given time, you can take a snapshot of your supply chain and there are limits. What are the limits? What are the constraints that you have to deal with? There's a finite amount of goods that you can produce at any given time. There is a finite amount of goods that you can ship from point A to point B at any time. And yes, this is very related to the theory of constraints, inspired by the theory of constraints. But it basically says, if you're trying to move 50 containers of something from point A to point B, and you only have capacity to do two, what, you know, that, that's the constraint that you're dealing with. Okay. Next, the law of information. Information, as we said, showing that in that last supply chain diagram, moves at the speed of light, or rather at the speed of the internet, which theoretically is at the speed of light, but we all know when uh, we try to bring up certain emails and pages and whatnot, it's not quite at the speed of light. But it's much faster than it used to be. It used to be paper, fax, operation. Now things are pretty much digital and electronic and move pretty quickly. Uh, in, in consumer product goods, you try to say if, you, uh, if a consumer buys a, a bar of soap uh, at the local store, the maker of caustic uh, will know that there's been, theoretically could know that there's been uh, a depletion of one bar of soap and knows to replenish that, to the, that much caustic to the factory. Um, independent of, and, uh, this is all, of course, independent of the accuracy of the information. So inaccurate information, wrong information moves just as fast as right information. So the, the need for data management is critical. Um, lastly, the speed of the information is infinitely greater than the lead times that we have to deal with in the movement of goods. So if we're ordering raw and packed materials, if we're ordering finished goods from a contract manufacturer, the speed of information is much faster than that order cycle time. And the speed of the information is faster than any of the production rates that we have. Okay, so these are our three laws. All right, 
I know you were you signed on to the Sinclair supply chain physics and you were looking for something catchy. Do we have an e equals mc squared or distance equals one half times the gravitational constant times time squared or force equals mass times acceleration? Uh, unfortunately, um, I don't think we have that. I did think about e equals pi squared where p equals product volume and i equals the speed of information. But I didn't spend a lot of time on that because I would have to explain it. And other than just showing the formula, uh, you know, there was <laughs> I'm not smart enough to be able to have a formula like that. So, but remember, we're talking about something conceptual, and we're talking about a basis for providing dialogue within your organization to uh, foster communication and improvement across all functions. Let's look at some examples. And the first one is the law of interdependency. This is an actual strategic vision and is set by a chief supply chain officer once upon a time at a company I may or may not have worked for. Uh, the vision was set as, as follows, five things. Less factories around the world, sweat the assets, which means greater um, utilization of the factories uh, driving the OEE higher and higher. Uh, greater product assortment, this is something uh, marketing wanted, uh, so more SKUs, less inventory globally, and improved customer service. This was a global vision. So we want to have less factories around the world. We want to utilize them and have them running at a faster rate. We wanted greater product assortment, more SKUs, a variety of products. We want less inventory and improved customer service. So think about that for a second. And then answer this question just to yourself. How do you think that all five of these things could be done? Could they? Well, our contention and experience, and this is assuming that things were already pretty effective and, and efficient in, in the functional improvement, uh, in, in, in the area of the siloed improvements that we're talking about. And at this company they were, they, they had done a lot of improvement. I think you could pick a few of these, two or three of these items, and, and, and maximize them at the expense of the other two or three. It's really playing supply chain whack-a-mole. In other words, if you uh, reduce the number of factories, your inventory is going to go up because you're moving products over greater distances. Your lead times will increase. If um, you increase the product assortment, that's going to do something to your inventory. If you drive inventory down and increase uh, your assortment and reduce the number of factories, that's going to have an impact on your service. And there were cases in, in, that, in that company where it, this exactly happened. Uh, there was a, they, they were sweating the assets so much that uh, supply was constrained. Inventory, and, inventory went down and service went down. And it became a huge issue. This is a violation of the law of supply chain physics, uh, the very first one, the interdependency. Now let's look at the, the law of constraints. You're buying goods from Asia. This is not unique. Lots of people buy goods from Asia. Uh, it might be unique that your order cycle time is only four weeks by ocean. Um, you've done a lot of, you've done some work. You've created buffers at the supplier so that there's a store of finished goods that you can order from stock as opposed to order to manufacturing uh, planning process. Um, and your transportation is actually in line with the cost of your goods. That's why you're using ocean. It's not, a, it's not an expensive good. Remember my background a lot is in consumer packaged goods. So we're using ocean to move these products. You're challenged. Can you get the goods in two weeks? Can you get them in one week? Can you get them in one day? Is that possible? Is that violating the law of constraints? Well, you say, yes, you can do that because we all have experience if you want to pay extra. And that's where the, the supply chain physical world differs from the, um, the real world physics that we studied in high school and college. But at what cost? Can we pay a premium? Can we pay the same? Can we pay less? I've been challenged many times uh, in my career to say, can you get it in two weeks at less cost? Yeah, sure, we can do that. The law of constraints and inter interdependency both apply here, even though the example was to show a constraint. There's a violation of the laws of supply chain physics once more. How about the law of information? Let's take a look at that. What do we, what do we mean by this law? What's an example? Well, 
it's easy to write or type or enter a number into an order quantity form or box or page on a, on a, on a computer. I can enter one as easily as I can enter a million. So you can see that we can enter one, 10, 100, whatever number we want. That doesn't mean that you can necessarily deliver it and this information will move very quickly through the entire supply chain and cause uh, problems if you've entered the wrong numbers and don't do anything about it or if you've violated how much your, your order quantities. Um, goods, again, remember, move in space and time. So if you order more and the information moves fast, you're violating, you're forcing a violation of the law of constraints by having your information also be faulty. You have, if you order one to 10, that's like a green light. We can, we can do that. We can make that happen. If you order 100, maybe that's a yellow light and that's iffy whether we can do that. Uh, if you're ordering 1,000 units or 10,000 units, then perhaps you're saying, oh my God, uh, that's getting into orange, which is uh, a mix of yellow and red. Or when you're at 10,000, you're definitely in the red zone. So here's the example. You're running your factory, it's running 24-7. It has a capacity of uh, 10,000 units a week. You get a huge quarter end order and you're tasked with producing uh, 13,500 units in, in less than a week. Okay, it was the information moved very quickly. We all had the information. Everybody knew what to do with it, but it moved faster, grossly faster than our ability to produce and our production rates. That's a violation of the law of supply chain physics as well. Let's talk a little bit more about this concept and how we have used it uh, to with clients and at companies that we have worked for before. When we talk about this concept of supply chain physics, we talk about limits to what can and can't be done. And let's call these limits what they are. They're the constraints of which we have to deal with. So at any given time, you take a snapshot of your supply chain. You need to know what these constraints are and they have to be communicated with our business partners. And our business partners are the commercial and management people that we deal with on a daily basis, sales, marketing, finance, and general management. If we look at our supply chain world as a box and represent that as our world, the edges of the boxes are the constraints. These are the borders that tell us what we can and cannot do. So what are these constraints, you ask? Well we already measure and track them. They're the KPIs, the, the things that we're held accountable for as supply chain professionals. There are lead times, manufacturing lead times, there are all of our transit times, our production rates and capacities, there are warehouse utilization, and you know, warehouse utilization is bad when we go over 100% and are forced to use outside space at higher rent, driving up cost. Uh, we all know at month end, quarter end, year end, oftentimes all the, all the uh, transportation equipment that we need to move goods to customers are not always available. And then we have something called demand volatility, which we deal with all the time in trying to make our forecasts more accurate or our demand plans more accurate. So these are the constraints that we're dealing with. So if we operate inside the box, and I can't tell you the number of times that we've used this actual holding our hands like this. If we operate inside the box and, and do, you know, the, our place orders that are well established, well communicated within the constraints of this world, heeding the laws of supply chain physics, any failure is the responsibility of the supply chain. So at any given point in time, we can say, here is our operating principles. If we operate as an organization this way, it's up, we guarantee that we can execute. Of course, there's going to be the, the cases where you can't, but hopefully those will be the rare exception. So if the demands on a supply chain are within the established and communicated lead times and at the established and communicated quantities and the delivery dates are also what we've communicated, we, the supply chain, have to make it happen. That's our commitment to the organization. Now, if we operate outside the box and ignore the laws of physics at that point in time. Any failure is responsibility of the company entirely. It's not just the supply chain. Of course, the supply chain will definitely be blamed for this, but it's not 
if we've communicated things properly, it's, it's an organizational failure. If the demands on the supply chain are outside the established and communicated lead times, if they're beyond the established and communicated quantity limits, and have delivery schedules that are unreasonable uh, according to what we've communicated, then we will still make every effort to make it happen because that's what we do. We're professionals. We're solid, committed business partners. We will fight fires. We will go crazy. We will have overtime. We will people will work ridiculous hours to make it happen. But we have to know, and the organization has to know, that not obeying the laws of supply chain physics has an increased risk of not meeting all of our goals. So. Yes, we operate outside this world all the time. That happens a lot of times in business. But I think over time, we'd rather do it as an exception and make exceptions become rare exceptions as opposed to everyday occurrence. And that's part of the reason we want to start using this concept of supply chain physics and communicating with our, our business partners. When we violate the laws, we've already decided by the laws of interdependency, we compromise inventory service quality and cost. And when we compromise inventory that, that causes us cash, that costs us cash and, and diminishes profits, when we compromise service that affects customer loyalty, sales and profits, when we compromise quality, it's customer loyalty and profits, and cost obviously takes it right off the bottom line. So we compromise performance when we violate these laws. And notice that profits is in every one of those. So not accounting for the physical realities of the supply chain at any given time, as with the constraints that we've talked about, the limits that we've talked about and at any given time, that will compromise and cause trade-offs in performance. The organization needs to know and probably needs a report card, and this is something we're going to cover in the next two sessions in more depth, when we're operating within the world, when we're operating properly, and when we're operating outside the world of supply chain physics. And, and uh, I, I think we're already setting it up for a green, yellow, and red light kind of uh, report card on this. And it's important. So now, we can change the world. What are we talking about here? Well, our supply chain world is in, it's, it's always in constant change. Uh, you know, we have new supply sources, we have new supply locations, we have uh, material and commodity pricing changing all over the place. Uh, if we remember a couple of years ago, gasoline prices spiked in the middle of the year for almost no reason and then went down uh, an equal amount by the end of the year. Uh, there's new competition, there's new channels of uh, of trade that we have to deal with. There's economic factors of every kind, uh, the, like the recession we just had. There's innovations and changes in technology. ERP systems are constantly evolving. And making this makes for a world of constant flux. In fact, uh, anytime you read a supply chain paper, or I, I'll date myself by saying total quality uh, kind of paper, they always start with the pace of change is accelerating rapidly. And, you know, it's been accelerating rapidly from the papers that were printed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Now I'm dating myself by going back that far. Uh, but you, you get the point. Things are always changing. And as things are always changing, our supply chain world is changing. And the good news is, is we can affect our world. We can bring changes. We can take our our box with the constraints around it. We can move it, we can make it bigger to accommodate these changes. We can make it smaller. Sometimes events make it smaller and we have to accommodate for those. And you see I've just drawn some, diff we've drawn some different shapes here so you can tell. Uh, the trapezoid is clearly more, more effective than the square. All right, so what can we change? We can change our lead times and we, we've done that. We can change our transit times our, our production rates, our production capacities, we can add capacity when we need, we can uh, improve our warehouse utilization, we can build new more effective warehouses, factories, we can uh, negotiate with material and transportation suppliers if we have, if, if we're more reliable than our competitors that are all using the same transportation assets at the end of the month, quarter or year 
and, and we can demonstrate our reliability, we can be guaranteed uh, equipment when we need it. Now let's look at, I've, I've, I've taken the, the demand volatility and blown it up uh, because this is an area where everybody is concerned about trying to improve their, their supply chain world. Uh, and this is dependent on so many different things from the number of SKUs to whether you have a good SKU management process. Um, are all customers equal? You know, you can do an activity analysis on your customer base and um, decide that some customers are not profitable and maybe you want to push them off to, uh, to uh, distributors and wholesalers. Uh, do, you, do you have your minimum order quantities well established and well communicated? Do you have incentives to your customers to adhere to those minimum order quantities? Uh, can you change the order pattern? If you have unnatural um, peaks, quarter end, month end, um, year end, uh, can you flatten that out somehow? Can you provide incentives for customers to buy earlier? We always talk about the the fact that we've trained our customers to order in the patterns that they order, so, but we can untrain them, and how do we do that? Uh, that's not something the supply chain can do by itself. That's where we need the cooperation of other functions. When we make these changes, do we make it, how big do we want to make it? Do we want to encompass all of these, all of the activity that's happening outside the world of our constraints, or do we want to only do some of them? And if we only do some of them, is that because it's by choice or it can take us? So in this concept of supply chain physics, we have to continually improve our supply chain to adapt to the changing world around us and accommodate the business needs that we have. We have to communicate what it is to our business partners and then constantly improve our world and change our world because we're masters of our supply chain world through proven proven methodologies that we've used. We've used we use lean methodologies, Six Sigma and uh, other technologies which is the ERP systems that we talk about. If we look at safety stock as, as a final example here and this is again a prelude to the kinds of things that we'll get more in depth in the next session. Safety stock is uh, the standard deviation of historical demand times some service level which you transform into a Z factor from the normal distribution table and a lead time factor as well. And basically your safety stock is a multiplication of those three things. It's, it's a cost. It's a necessary cost that we have to take a, into account the inefficiencies and bad processes throughout the organization that requires us to have this safety stock. Now, if we reduce safety stock, the, the, the uh, law of interdependency tells us that you'll have a service risk. Uh, so if we harness all these three laws together and drive down safety stock in an intelligent way, um, this safety stock decreases with lead time, so we need suppliers and manufacturing to comply with this. Safety stock would decrease if we can dampen demand volatility somehow, and we need sales and, and customers to play nice to make this happen. Uh, I didn't say it was easy, but it's things that we have to look at. And like I said, we will get more into this into the, in, the, in the second session of this. So in conclusion, there is such a thing as supply chain physics. And we've defined three laws. The law of interdependency, which says uh, inventory service quality and cost are interdependent and that the function, the functional improvement can only take you so far. And then after that, you need cross-functional cooperation to improve things uh, further. We have the law of constraints that says uh, if you're moving things from point A to point B, you're limited by uh, how much you can physically move at any given time and how much, uh, how much of any product you can produce at any given time. We have the law of information that says information now moves at the speed of light or the speed of the internet and that information moves much faster than our lead times and our production capacities and production lead times. 
We provided a conceptual basis for communicating these ideas, and then we showed that we can change the world. And um, so that concludes a short presentation today of uh, this concept of supply chain physics. And let's take a look at some of the questions that you've submitted, and we'll provide some further discussion. Yes, Mark, we had um, some really great questions. Uh, the first is from Jim, and he says, this is a pretty cool concept. Can we make it more definitive and real or operational somehow? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, because, like I said, earlier today, we're, we're pre presenting this as a concept, and it's an important concept. Um, where we've used it in other companies, uh, it, 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 we feel really good when we come back six months later and people that we haven't even presented to or talked to about it are saying, hey, we're violating a law of supply chain physics. That means the concept is forcing that kind of dialogue that we want. Yes, um, Jim, you can make it more definitive, but that has to be done within your organization, and we'll provide some strategies for that in the next two sessions. Uh, but it's really dependent on building up your, your report card of when you're violating the laws and what happens. Uh, if you think about um, an organization where, uh, let's look at the example where we had to produce 13,500 units uh, in six days when the capacity is 10,000. Now, we know that if we, can, if we produce 13,000, we're going to have some quality problems perhaps seep into the marketplace. We're going to have to expedite transportation. So all of a sudden, costs are going to go up. Everybody gives us high fives on the first of the next month if we've achieved those goals. But then when it comes time to look at our performance at the end of the year, they'll say, geez, your transportation costs were high, you're, you get dinged for quality, and no, no one remembers that you, you've made those changes, uh, those, you made those trade-offs in order to deliver that quarter end. All right, any other questions? Um, you know, we actually only have one other question, so I want to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, go ahead and send them to us right now. Uh, but the next question is uh, from Ricardo, and he says, if we work within our world, managers wouldn't be needed at all. Is the manager someone who decides where and how to compromise, or is he the one who tries to change the constraints? Uh, yes to both, actually. Um, no matter if, if we work within a supply chain world, uh, that's an ideal that you want to work towards because you'll never really, I don't think, fully achieve it. You're always going to have something that needs to be expedited. You're always going to have something that needs to be, um, you need to make the trade-offs between inventory and cost and service and, and quality. And it's a manager's job to guide the organization through that. It's also the manager's job to uh, prioritize the improvements that need to be made to accommodate the changing world and the world changes all the time so I think the managers are still very very much needed if we look at a violation of the law of supply chain physics maybe it's like looking at product defects if we go back to the original uh, uh, Dr. Deming era of quality if you're operating at 30% defects, if you're operating at 30% of your transactions are in a violation of supply chain physics you're you're a firefighter. That's your life. You're scurrying around just trying to make things happen and hold things together with duct tape and bailing wire. If you can reduce the violations down to like less than 5% or to 1%, then when you have a violation, you can dedicate energy and, and, and your entire energy to it and solve the problems. Uh, way back when we, looked at, when we were looking at quality, uh, the, the Japanese companies if they had a defect, they would put a new product on a, leather, uh, on a velvet pillow and take it to uh, the customer that was wronged. But you can do that when you have one out of a million defects. But you can't do that when you have 30% defects. So the same principle would apply here. You would look at a violation of supply chain physics as a defect that you want to, to uh, reduce that rate all the time. So I think managers are, are definitely needed to help guide the organization through that. And you'll always have, uh, there will always be work to do because if you get too efficient and too effective, uh, you just put in an attrition program and, and don't hire new managers as they turn over and uh, they'll be busier anyway. All right. Uh, uh, let's take one from Raul, uh, my old friend from Mexico. Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, Raul asks, 
How valid is it to violate the supply chain physics that you mentioned in order to get a better trade-off into the company? Always thinking in the company profit. Okay. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, in the supply chain, we're committed to deliver business results. And the largest business results are top line, bottom line results of sales and profit. So we're going to always try to make the month. We're always going to try to make the quarter. We're always going to try to make the year. I mean, and that goes without question. And we will do whatever it takes. Unfortunately, whatever it takes means overtime, expediting. It means rescheduling. It might be compromising quality where we don't want to in order to make those kinds of numbers. And we do it knowing what the trade-offs are, but maybe we don't communicate them all the time. That's a topic we're going to definitely talk about in, 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 in session two. First of all, we're business people and we're part of the management team of the organization. We have to deliver the business goals, but over time we have to deliver, deliver those more effectively. Like I said, high fives the first of the month, the first of the year for, for delivering on the quarter or delivering on the year. And then when it comes time for review time, you're saying, well, your performance was this, that, and the other thing. So if we can deliver the quarter and the year and meet our performance objectives, then we're, we have a, a supply chain physics world that's operating properly. Let's go to Mike's question. Or maybe it's oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if that was a comment. I'm sorry. It's a comment um, then a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, what Mike is saying is that he likes the way Mark has stated the laws of interdependency management. And it often sets uh, ambitious goals for each of the silos that are often in conflict with each other. Um, he asks, how can you help management see these conflicts and improve performance for the organization as a whole? You know, I, I was thinking, uh, Mike, great question. I was thinking about actually naming the, um, the second part of, of this presentation, which we'll have December 9th, uh, the supply chain that can sometimes say no. Um, we still may change it to that, but w what we want to say is if we have to meet the business objectives first and foremost, but then we have to do a post-mortem afterwards to say what could we have done better and what were the real costs, what were the trade-offs. I don't think organizations do that enough. You know, we let finance sort it out and as soon as they give you the, like I said, we get the high five for making the month or the making the year. And then three weeks after that, we're being hammered for inventory, we're being hammered for quality, or we're being hammered for uh, overtime being too high or something of that nature. And everybody's forgotten what the reasons were for that. So we've got to look at that. I, I have a, a scheme where I actually think that part of the safety stock, the demand volatility part, is not in the hands of the supply chain. It's really the responsibility of uh, our sales partners. So uh, we'll be presenting that next time. And it's always been a dream of mine that I'd love to have sales have an inventory goal based on their uh, on demand volatility. What else you got, Jolene? I think that is all the questions we have. All right. We, we can take some more if you want. Um, we'll, we'll hang on a little bit. Oh, it looks like we just got another one, Mark. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, it always seems that our... Best laid plans are always blown up by sales with drop in orders and all. Is there a way to effectively manage this dynamic without creating a confrontation? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, you know, you got to put yourself, it's, it's easy to always be in a supply chain and always blame sales. It's probably always easy to be in sales and always blame the supply chain. Um, Sales guys, at least the ones that I know and like and spend a lot of time with, um, you know, they're dealing with customers. And customers are, 
always trying to do the best for their organization. So they're waiting till the end of the month. They're waiting to see how much we'll reduce our, um, our terms and conditions and pricing in order to make uh, a month or a quarter or a year. And uh, if we don't acquiesce or we think we're going to get an order or not get an order, we have a problem with that. If we are out of stock on an item, we have salespeople that don't trust the system enough because we haven't provided the reliability and keep placing the same order over and over again, uh, causing an artificial decrease in service levels. So I believe that in, in the supply chain, the, the relationship with sales has to be like this. We've got to be, we, they have to be our greatest ally. And one area that they're our greatest ally is, believe it or not, at least in our experience, is seeing in the area of SKU reduction. Uh, while marketing tends to want to increase the product assortment, sales realizes that it's easier to sell less things than more. So I hope that that answers the question. Did we have any more? That concludes our questions. That concludes the question. So uh, we've gotten this done in less than an hour, which is good because we're, we're cognizant of your time. I appreciate everybody that's, uh, that's joined into the um, webinar. Uh, as stated, you will get an email, all participants or everybody that signed up will get an email tomorrow uh, where you can see a rebroadcast of this at any time on our website, uh, www.demandcaster.com. And um, the slides will be available for downloading uh, from there. And we encourage you to join us for parts two and three. Uh, the live broadcast will be December 9th for part two and, and, and January 13th, both of those being Wednesdays, again at noon central time, Chicago time. So I thank everyone for joining and um, hopefully uh, we'll see you again in December and January. Thank you very much.